Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. So, Steampunk. When I say Steampunk, I mean Steampunk literature. Not the fashion, not the design, and none of the other great things that we associate with the movement. Which is fine. I mean, I need to specialize so I can basically do a good job of looking into this phenomenon. Now, this time I'm going to talk about literary genres in general where they come from, why they exist, and how we classify things. And sometimes it seems like literary genres have no rhyme or reason. A lot of them are very elemental, very basic, like horror, or comedy, or even erotica. These are basic emotional states of the human experience. There are others that are get more specific, you know, that are situational. Uh, such as mystery, romance, satire, adventure. And these two are very general, but they don't depend on a setting. Finally, you have those genres that depend specifically on setting. Latent example being the American Western. And, of course, we have the noir detective story, which takes place you know, usually in the 30s in a, in a big city like L.A. Or, of course, steampunk. <music> steampunk being one of those genres that depends on setting, uh, we not only look at place, we look at the time period. Typically, the story takes place in the late 1800s, and most often in England or America uh, or sometimes continental Europe in big cities and uh, these kind of urban settings. As you know, if you follow this channel, I do allow for steampunk fantasy, and that's any time you have a setting that is sort of quasi-Victorian in that they have that same level of technology and kind of a similar uh, culture and class structure. But, you know, that's mostly because it was so popular and there was a lot of steampunk work that sort of fed off of that major, major uh, boom during the late aughts and early 20-teens. Probably, again, as I said earlier, the most genre-dependent or the most setting-dependent genre, rather, is the American Western, which pretty much has to take place in the West. And it can be any place in North America, because you have, would have to include Mexico, and you would have to include Canada. Once in a while, things will happen in Canada. Yeah, it doesn't seem like much happens up there, but it does. <laughs> anyway, um, and it would usually have to be to the west of the Mississippi. and you can hardly have it be in the 20th century. It's usually in the 19th, late 19th. Now, once in a while, maybe you could take a cowboy to Argentina to hang out with the gauchos and the pampas. But in general, it's an American thing. You do have such a thing as a sci-fi western, which is kind of a strange mishmash. And my favorite being the TV series Firefly, which I'm sure many of you know and love. However. That is an anomaly. For the most part, the Western has to be in the West, and it has to be in the 19th century. The Germans have a word called Zeitgeist, and that's what I'm talking about here, spirit of the age. So the Western has its character from that spirit, as do steampunk and other setting-dependent genres. Now, the word zeitgeist refers to the themes that dominate a society in a particular time and place. Kind of like not just the philosophy and the culture and the religion, etc., but the fads and fashions and the current preoccupations of the people. For example, in Europe, in the high Middle Ages, we had this emphasis on knighthood and chivalry. Of course, it may not have been that realistic. You know, we may have remembered a lot of things wrong and, and romanticized and kind of glossed over the negative aspects. But nonetheless, it is part of the age. It is part of the way we think about that era, and it's part of 
what, what we write about or read about when we have a uh, basically a story about knights and uh, quests and all these things. And we have fiction from way back. The, the Song of Roland, <laughs> uh, a, a epic poem written in, I think, around 1100. And Cervantes' Don Quixote, 1605, in which he's like mocking uh, this uh, medieval literature for, for its ability to make people delusional. So that is a perfect example of a literary era, the Middle Ages, and or the Age of Chivalry. And it's kind of hard to define that. I kind of think of it as being synonymous with the Crusades, when these knights started leaving their homes and going on these quests to free the Holy Land from those rotten Muslims. <laughs> and uh, they were always trying to do good deeds on the way. Although in real history, of course, they weren't entirely good deeds. They would try to help out damsels in distress and so on and oppose the villainous characters that they met. And Robin Hood is a perfect example of this sort of chivalric tale. In early times, the story involved Robin Hood as a knight who went to the Middle East and returned and found the sheriff of Nottingham had stolen his land and he has to get it back. Later on, they made him a commoner who was fighting for the rights of the peasants. And he was fighting against this evil sheriff who was in league with Prince John, who was portrayed as sort of a usurper. But what happened was King Richard the Lionheart had went to Palestine to fight. And so they had to have a king. And King John was just not as popular or well-liked. And Robin Hood, of course, is loyal to King Richard. And so these stories of chivalry all have these these themes, part of the time, part of the spirit of the age, rather, and these themes of faith and sacrifice, honor, courtly love, in which you you adore this woman, but you don't take advantage of her because you are a gentleman and you are a hero. And the villains, the base villains that they have to oppose, their cruel depredations, etc. And of course, the infidel Turks, who are sometimes hopefully portrayed as worthy adversaries because they were brave and often noble in their own way. Now, the age of chivalry is not to be confused with the age of King Arthur. A lot of Americans are probably kind of clueless on that aspect because that was like five centuries earlier in uh, the 500s. This was not that long after the Romans had left Britain. And so things were very different, you know, technologically, culturally, etc. Arthur, if he really existed, and he may possibly be based on a truly historical character, was a Welshman, not an Englishman, because Anglo-Saxons hadn't been in England that long. They were still kind of infiltrating and intermarrying with the local Celts. So, so Arthur was not really uh, English. That's why they call him King of the Britons, <laughs> you'll notice. And uh, Monty Python has a lot of fun with this and the Holy Grail. They really do mix up a lot of these themes, a lot of these later uh, crusader themes, like the Holy Grail, for example, uh, with the earlier magical themes of King Arthur. Now, I am more familiar with recent history. And by recent, I mean the last 500 years, which uh, was started around the age of Columbus. Uh, discovering America for the Europeans. Now, of course, my peeps, uh, the Vikings, they came here earlier, but they didn't stick around. So unfortunately, we didn't have the kind of mark on history that we should have. And things would have been very different. Some of these alternate history people, and I love those channels, they will talk about this sort of thing. So last week I reviewed a series called The Baroque Cycle by Neil Stevenson, which takes place in some of these earlier centuries. Uh, the Scientific Revolution, the Age of Enlightenment. Historians date the former from around 1543 when Copernicus first published his treatise on the heliocentric universe. That is, the sun is really the center, not the earth. Stevenson starts a little later. He starts with Isaac Newton. Uh, around the time of his Principia Mathematica in uh, 1687. Now, there's a great steampunk work that does deal with the age of Copernicus, Pasquale's Angel, by Paul Macaulay, 
I suppose specifically we could call that Rococo Punk. Uh, one of those weird offshoots that I talked about recently. However, uh, there's not enough of those to really justify a separate category. But I do love that book. It is very cool. And it shows that you can bring steampunk to earlier eras as well. So anyway, all this enlightenment stuff, all this scientific progress and so on, all this financial innovation that Stevenson likes to write about, these led to a lot of other things. I mean, these led to progress. They, they, they led to prosperity. But they also led to some revolutions that shook the world. They led to the American Revolution, which didn't have a big effect at first. It was later that, that we Americans kind of dominated the world stage. What was more significant at that time was the French Revolution, 1789. And this shook up everything because the chaos that ensued kind of overturned a lot of Europe. And then Napoleon took the helm and decided to impose his will on most of the continent. We had that leading to revolutions in Haiti, for example, the first successful slave revolt in 1804. And we also had this Spanish uh, yoke being thrown off in Latin America, Simon Bolivar. And he was able to success successfully pursue his revolutions, partially because the Spanish were busy fighting the French. And I'm sure there's a lot of literature that was written from this era not something I'm familiar with, but something worth investigating. Because, again, a very heroic era in human history. Now, back to England. In England, there was this little thing called the Industrial Revolution, which was not a political revolution, but was even more powerful. Because there was this advancement of technology, including steam power, which led to mechanized factories. And investments and investments and other things such as chemistry and metallurgy and eventually medicine and improving things in great strides. Now, in the early times, there were all these upheavals which caused a lot of social chaos and discontent, a lot of poverty, of pollution and misery. And this is where we see a lot of the dystopian kind of muckraking literature of the early 1800s, uh, things that people like Charles Dickens was writing about. And this is probably why a lot of these early steampunk writers from the 1990s said, well, steampunk literature must be dystopian. Although that's only one side of the matter. I mean, there were good aspects to this era too. There were people who had these, you know, extravagant and elegant lives as written by Jane Austen and this was the Regency period in the early 1800s, and a lot of romances are set in that era. So it's a very popular literary era, which is, again, the theme of the age. Although this tended to go with the aristocracy and not any of those um, uh, kind of sad, smelly, poor people. <laughs> now, in the mid-1800s, things got better. I mean, England started to see the fruits of some of this progress. And Queen Victoria took the throne in 1837. And this is what we call the Victorian era, which became more chaste and modest than the earlier Regency period had been. And it had all this progress. And there was a middle class coming about. And there was women's suffrage was an issue. I mean, all these things. Uh, abolition. Uh, actually, that happened earlier in Britain, but it... It happened, you know, later in the United States and all of these social movements. But again, we had people with leisure time, people who could write novels that people would buy and read. So we had great literature, you know, Sherlock Holmes uh, by Conan Doyle. And we had the scientific romances of people like H.G. Uh, Wells. And of course, in France had their great Jules Verne. And we had a utopian versus dystopian dichotomy. Many writers thought humankind would continue to make progress. There would be trouble, but of course we would get, get uh, higher and higher and we'd go to the moon like Jules Verne wrote about. Wales, on the other hand, seemed to like to imagine all these bad things that might happen. <laughs> you know, like the time machine go, went forth and saw uh, 
the terrible divisions that industrialization had brought to humankind. So I kind of see Verne as the optimist and H.G. Wells as the pe pessimist, although they both wrote some rather nuanced stories. So this is the era of steampunk. This is the ideal time. And pretty much the entire 19th century was the age of steam. But, you know, steampunk tends to be the time of Queen Victoria, 1837 to 1901, who was Britain's longest reigning monarch, until Elizabeth II, that is. The signature of this age was the Great Exposition in 1851, where all these uh, company, countries came together in London, and they showed off the great technology of Britain, and other countries showed off their innovations as well. So the theme was progress. The gentleman inventor and the advancements, the riches that can be made from trade and innovation rather than just plunder. Of course, speaking of plunder, of course, the Britons had their empire in India and Africa and the Caribbean. And so you had a lot of stories being written about war and heroism and uh, sacrifice again and uh, manly courage, things like that. So an, another theme of the age. But at the same time, there was romance. And a lot of the steampunks I've seen written in the last five years have been romances. Uh, and I think this is because a lot of women are tired of the uh, androgynous spirit of this age, and they'd like to see times when men were masculine and women were feminine. And a man would sweep her off her feet <laughs> and uh, so on. And, and she'd have multiple suitors after her. You know, she'd have the good boy and the bad boy, etc., etc. And uh, it's kind of interesting because this was the time when women's rights first became an issue. So there was a tension between this tradition and innovation, but it hadn't yet kind of destroyed traditional values. The Victorian era, uh, for all its benefits and faults, had its equivalent in many other countries. And I've written about some of those. In America, we had the Gilded Age, which ran from the end of the Civil War to the terror and the chaos of World War I. But back to the neighborhood of England, the continent, there was the Belle Epoque, or the Beautiful Era, which is French, but so it's mostly talking about France and all the progress they had after the uh, Franco-Prussian War, 1871. And at the same time, this was the time when the German nation kind of came together from all these little states, and as well as the Italian nation. So a lot of change. And speaking of the Franco-Prussian War, my own great-great-grandfather fought in that war. And afterwards, hard times, his family was hungry, he had to come to America. Again, this was nationalist feeling. This was great leaders like Bismarck and so on, who had a great effect on the world. They introduced things like public education. Actually, Prussia was a leader in this. Back to America in the Gilded Age, this was when we had all these wealth being made, these fortunes, the inventors such as, as Edison and Tesla, who came to America for this opportunity, and the barons of industry, who were often called robber barons. This was the same time as the Wild West, uh, and uh, just in a different part of the country. Although the Wild West, I would say start that at around the time of settling of Texas. And you have the War for Independence there, the Alamo. Uh, we had the Oregon Trail and so on, the Indian Wars, uh, the Mexican War, the California Gold Rush, all of these uh, very chaotic, often violent and heroic struggles. So a very manly literature, as the Westerns usually are, with uh, gentlemanly uh, sheriffs and cowboys and heroes and uh, evil dastardly villains. So a very black and white type of uh, moralistic literature. But there are also steampunks written in a Western setting, uh, such as David Lee Summers. Uh, his series uh, that started with Owl Dance, which is very cool.
Even Japan had its own steampunk era, which was called the Meiji Restoration. Restoration meaning it restored the imperial rule of the emperor. This coincided with the rule of Mutsuhito, uh, who became the emperor Meiji in 1868, and he ruled to 1912, another long reigning monarch uh, with a lot of innovation, uh, just like Victoria. He, however, brought a lot of changes to Japan. I mean, they had just opened up the foreign trade a few years earlier, and he basically broke the power of the samurai, which kind of makes us Americans sad. We are the ones who love the samurai literature. And uh, so the samurai had their swords taken away. They had their power taken away. And Japan became more egalitarian. And they adopted a lot of Western technology and culture and modes of dress. You see these pictures of men in Western suits while their wives are still wearing kimonos. It's very striking. A lot of great steampunk style fiction being produced in manga and anime. One of my favorite is Golden Kamui, which takes place during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905 and involves a lot of what we would call Western themes of you know, treasure and the quarrel with the natives, which in this case are not the Apache, but the Ainu, uh, the native people of Japan. Yes, they did have their own uh, natives that they sort of oppressed. As you can see, steampunk has its echoes throughout the world. It's not just England. There's all these places that had this same kind of revolutionary era that have all this kind of the same zeitgeist, the same themes of uh, not just adventure and intellectual advancement, uh, but also poverty and depredations. And so it's a lot to do with our common humanity, which is one of the reasons I love historical fiction so much. It, it shows our common heritage and how all different human societies had similar struggles and uh, what we can be proud of in our heritage, despite our mistakes. We all made mistakes. We all had great heroic achievements. So this has been my show on literary eras and how the different eras of history create different themes in literature. Please let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'd always appreciate suggestions, which I try to carry out. Please also like and subscribe so we can get out the good steampunk word. Also, check out my works on Amazon. As always, I will have the links in the description. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.